Hello everyone, my name is Nils. Um, I'm the chairman and chief creative officer at an agency called Grey London. Um, I'm not, it's difficult to follow that because some of that work was really, really beautiful. I'm not going to show too much work at all. I, I wanted us to talk a bit, really. Uh, the non-fight for creativity. So I want to start with this, which is most of us are creative here and we talk constantly about the threat to creativity from business and from money and from data and stuff. And I think that's bullshit. Um, I think that creativity isn't under threat uh, at all. Um, but I think the problem is that we think it's a discipline, right? We think creativity is an award, and we're like, oh, it's under threat from all this stuff. It's not. If you view it differently, creativity, I think, is the threat. And I think the problem might be us and how we behave and the sort of companies that we run. And this is what I'd like to talk about today. Really, I think that creativity is a survival mechanic. I think it's what you do when you're in trouble. Uh, it's not a cravat. Uh, you know what that is? Like those kind of posh things that, that kind of people wear. You know, and I'm a creative and I've got a cravat. It's a pen in the throat. Um, this is creativity. The guy that worked out that you could save a life by sticking a biro in someone's throat, that's creativity, right? That's amazing. Uh, drinking got boring, and then we made Jaeger bombs. That's creativity. Like, and creativity is, is a response to a, either boredom or frustration or a problem. Um, this is contentious in this room, I realize now. <laughs> That's the armada. But creativity is setting fire to all your boats so that you can be a larger fleet, maybe, discuss. And when music got shit and expensive, this came along. And that was creativity. And I guess I just wanted us to look at what that meant and, and stop worrying so much about creativity and what it means and noodle around. Because um, creativity isn't worried, but everyone else should be, uh, I think. Dear production, stop being so precious. Uh, I think in our industry, we all sit around and we like to craft stuff and we hire these amazing directors and we spend fortunes on production. I think that has to change now. I know we've seen a lot of work recently in the, you know, the social stuff where we do stuff at next to zero cost. You know, the invention of these cameras has changed it completely. Um, and I think the production as a rule needs to sort of stop being so wanky and precious about it all and needs to loosen up and actually become a force for, for quick uh, response and for speed and for action, you know. Um, I wanted to show you one thing that we did. We got a brief from a, a beer that we look after called Green King. And it's like an old man's beer uh, in the UK. And they asked us for an advert, and we were like, oh, God, here we go. They're going to want an ad where a load of old guys are in a pub, and they're like, oh, this is lovely, and beer. And, uh, we didn't want to do that. So we got 50 um, phones with a camera with video on, and we just sent them to 50 pubs. Um, and we've made a, a, a long-form film from it. And it was really interesting to see what you got back. Some of them were awful, uh, you know, and semi-pornographic, and some were really moving and, and were really interesting. And I'd, I'd just love to show you this uh, now. A meeting place, something that's sadly disappearing so fast in this country. You take a pub out of a village, and you've just got a stretch of road with houses. There wouldn't be a community, there wouldn't be a place to go to. Come on, old girl, here we go again. I don't know how this thing's meant to work. It's just a good get-together where you can have a laugh and a giggle and just forget about the world for a bit. Oh! Cheers. Cheers. You get to see the same faces, you get to see new faces. Well, I like coming to pubs because I like to have a drink and socialise it. It's the only time I can get out. The wife won't let me out the rest of the week. Only gas and air. Only gas and air, yeah. I went to sit on one day, I had her in my arms. Yeah. Quite emotional it was, really. Cheers. 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 Cheers.
I pull my mic, this guy loses boy in the bay. <laughs> this is the happiest day of my life. Yeah, it is. anything you want it to be. It's for families, it's for young people, it's for the older people, for the darts players, for the footballers. <laughs> what makes the pub special? The people that come into it. Cracking day, absolutely cracking day. <laughs> Thanks. And, you know, that's in service of a larger thing, right? But it was really cheap to send those out. And the production, the, the shape of that production was very different and took a very different set of people to make that happen. Uh, and I, I just wanted to share that with you. I think strategy is, um, is under threat. I wanted to find an image of a clever woman eating numbers. I couldn't find one. I'll imagine one. Uh, but I think um, modern storytellers, you know, actually things like data, uh, things like social and all of the listening that's going on, the temptation is to think that strategy is a sort of numbers game now, and I don't think it is either. I think the same thing still applies. Someone has to make a leap, and they have to talk about the emotions of the world, and they have to find a way to connect with you. So these people, they have to understand all this stuff, but the old rules still apply, and they have to be modern storytellers. Um, truthfully, though, I think creativity is most angry at creatives, uh, and this is what I'd like to talk about today. I think we have this job title, creative, but I think we are actually some of the slowest people to change in our industry. You know, we like it the way it is. Um, dear creative directors, the trade union is dead. What do I mean by that? I mean that actually for many, many years, particularly in the UK, you come the same way, you, you kind of come up the same way, you come out the same schools, uh, you get your office, you work your way up, you know, you get told what to do, someone signs off your work, you make it, and one day you might end up in a corner office with a PA. And I think that's just dead, uh, actually along with corner offices, two PAs, white sofas, stamps with yes or no on, chains of command, and thinking that the client is always wrong, and thinking that planning is irrelevant, and thinking that a meaningful commitment to technology in your agency is a room with a 3D printer in. Uh, all of this is wrong and changing. And what's happening is we're seeing companies start all over the world that are a threat to this. And big agencies are the worst at this. And I think if you work in one like this, you should think about that. Uh, yeah, we're going to kill that guy. This guy, he, he's going to die. At Grey uh, in London, um, some stuff we killed just to talk about it. We, we removed sign-off. Agencies love sign-off. You know, the idea that you're important. Uh, you get to sign a sticker saying that something is approved by you. Uh, the illusion of control or quality, I think, is hilarious. We removed that um, because we thought it reinforced hierarchy and ego and dickheads. And also because it slowed things down. You know, you remember that old dichotomy of a queue of people waiting at the creative director's office for a sign-off, right? It was like mad. Why would you do that? Um, what it meant when we removed sign-off is that we have to trust people. And ultimately, I think that's what agencies are really bad at. Agencies are really bad at trust. Uh, so you have to hire well, you have to empower your people, you have to trust them, and then let them get on with it. We removed offices. Uh, we have a big point of view on that. A lot of people talk about going open plan because it's like cool and trendy. We went open plan because uh, we believe that if you have to knock on a door before you talk about a piece of work, that's getting in the way of you talking. Like, what's that about? Why have I got to knock on your door? Why are you important enough? Why are we having this relationship discussion about your importance before I can chat to you about the work? So we removed those. Uh, we killed departments. Again, the creative department is one of the worst at this. You know, this is the fucking creative department. And they're all there and, you know, they're all drunk by three o'clock and you walk up on that floor and you're like, oh, God, and you're scared. And if you're a junior planner, they eat you for breakfast like a little antelope. Um, and I just wanted to ban that, you know, so everyone is mixed up. So the, some of this stuff worked. But the truth is what we really tried to remove was dependency, you know, and we really wanted to let people know that it was on them. And the reason we did that originally was because Gray was crap, really bad. And the only way to motivate people to, to come out of that is to give them trust. And that creates energy and that creates other stuff. So I thought I'd, I'd show you that. Um, today, if you have the word creative in your job title, you're the most powerful person in the room, so stop being a douche. 
It's true. I think creatives um, are worried about their importance more than other disciplines. I think we freak out, and I think that's what makes us controlling and can make us hard to work with. And I think we need to chill out about it, because what we're seeing in the world is the power of creativity to properly change things, and it's never been more powerful. Um, and I just wanted us to talk about that. Creativity is angry at the ones who think marketing's a mechanic. Don't worry about this stuff. You know all these articles about oh my god, the mar you know they're turning it into a, a science, and it's not. It can't be because it will die if that happens. Um, we did a, one of the my favourite pieces of work we did was for the Sun newspaper. I don't know if you guys know it. It's actually S U N. Uh, and on the the day the royal birth, when um, you know the new prince was around, we got the editor to do that. Now that's not like marketing, they didn't ask us for an ad, but we had a fluid relationship with that paper to the point where we could do that. And it was the most tweeted uh, image in the UK on, the, on that day, the front cover of the sun with that change. Um, but that's sort of, there's no science to that, you can't do that, and you can't predict what that's going to do for the brand, but it was interesting. Um, creativity has pictures of brave clients on her wall. Uh, I think this is true as well. I think if there are any clients here or that hear about this, I would love them to believe that if they're fans of creativity, that they can flourish as well. That's David Patton, who's the guy who was at Sony who bought Balls and PlayStation Mountain and all those other brilliant bits of work. And David is now running our European sort of effort, and he's basically a rock star now, but he's the guy that made that happen alongside some of the creatives, and I think it's important to say that clients are recognizing that. Um, Creativity wants its 25,000 pounds back. I struggle with university, guys. I have a big point of view on it. And I think if you're going into this industry, uh, I would debate the need to go to university. I didn't. I got a job, uh, luckily, in the summer before I went off to uni at an ad agency. My friends spent 25,000 pounds, four years later, came out and started where I started then. And I couldn't see how that was fair. Um, and it, and it really bothered me. And I think that there are some courses, I'm not saying education is bad, but I think the university in general, particularly in the UK, is used like a sort of stopgap. You know, it's used as a sort of thinking time for people, and I worry about that. They spend a lot of money doing that. Um, spend 25,000 pounds, go to New York, get a job as Terry Richardson's assistant, that'll be far more fun. Um, we removed degrees from our qualifications at Grey London. It's not a massive thing, but it, it matters, because we were getting all the same people, particularly on the business side. We were getting you know, uh, Oxford and Cambridge and all that lot. And we really wanted to find a way to get a varying uh, bunch of people in the room. So we removed qualifications like that. I still don't know how to get the people I really want. The people I really want are the ones who aren't even going to uni because they've already set up a club night and they're already making 25 grand a week and they're already promoting it themselves. <laughs> they're the ones I wish we had. And I don't know how we get them, but that's what we should be doing. Um, I think also, ironically, from me, white male, uh, I think creativity does want us to stop being so typical, stop following in the same patterns as before. Uh, I think we'd just get better agencies if we did. Ultimately, and this is a thing, I think that most people hate ads. I know most people hate ads. Um, and I think that really our aim should be that normal people think what we do is okay. And I worry that we don't. I'm going to read you this. It's written by Banksy. People are taking the piss out of you every day. They butt into your life, take a cheap shot at you, and then disappear. They leer at you from tall buildings and make you feel small. They make flipping comments from buses that imply you're not sexy enough and that all the fun's happening somewhere else. They're on TV making your girlfriend feel inadequate. They have access to the most sophisticated technology the world has ever seen, and they bully you with it. They are the advertisers, and they're laughing at you. You, however, are forbidden to touch them. Trademarks, intellectual property rights, and copyright law mean advertisers can say what they want with total impunity. Fuck that. Any advert in a public space that gives you no choice, whether you see it or not, is yours. It's yours to take, rearrange, and reuse. You can do whatever you want with it. Asking for permission is like asking to keep a rock someone just threw at your head. You owe the companies nothing, less than nothing. You especially don't owe them any courtesy. They owe you. They have rearranged the world to put themselves in front of you. They never ask for your permission. Don't start asking for theirs. It's beautifully summed up. It's true. So how do you go about making stuff that doesn't do this? I think we have to do that or we will just disappear and die, and people will just switch off from everything that we do. Uh, we've not done loads of it. There's one thing I want to show you that started a conversation, I think, the right way. Um, it was a project for Volvo called Life Paint. I'm just going to show you the case study of it.
nearly every day something almost happens. You've kind of got to be able to second guess the taxi in front of you or the pedestrians coming up. I end up getting nearly hit at least once a day. The young driver lost concentration and hit me from behind. I was extremely lucky that day. The doctor said that 95% of people that sustained those injuries would have been killed by them. paint and the idea behind it is to well help save a life. Volvo not just thinking about car safety they're thinking about cycling safety. Have you ever seen someone else's idea take off and become a million dollar seller? Well here's another one you can add to the why didn't I think of that first file. Is life paint is super intelligent in life company Volvo под названием life paint. I think cycle safety is not all about bicycles, it's about cars, it's about pedestrians, it's about sharing the road with other users. So it's great that a car brand has got involved to essentially help cyclists and help drivers in the end and save lives. Um, thanks. Uh, someone told me last night that that was a great case study, but it was bullshit. <laughs> Thank you, creative people. Uh, it wasn't bullshit. It was hard to make them do loads of cans. The 20,000, they went like straight away, and we couldn't make it quick enough. And then we wanted another load, so we finally just got them, and we're rolling it out. But I, I hear you on the bullshit thing. We should watch out for that. Um, but you get it, we're trying to make something that actually matters in the world, either useful or entertaining. That's what someone else said. Our take on that is, yeah, useful or entertaining, but definitely viscerally famous. Uh, otherwise, it's just meaningless as, as well. Um, what I'm getting at is that really creative, to, you know, it's just coming, like winter in Game of Thrones. It's just constantly, constantly coming, okay? You can't do anything about that. So creativity is the threat. It's not under threat. Uh, and the only choice is how we respond. Um, the difference is not rock star creative directors, digital yogi, or Swedish teenagers. Uh, the difference is culture. Um, and I think it's about any sort of culture that you want to make, whether you're a three-person company or a 500-person company, you have to think about that. You have to think about how you go about your business, the sort of people you hire and fire. You have to think about the sort of work you make in the world and not just be happy that you made some. You're responsible for it. Um, creativity likes trust, as we've said, and energy beats talent. So. I believe this, which is there are absolute rock stars in our game. There are some brilliant, brilliant people. But you will beat them if they are cynical and if they don't have energy. You will beat them if you just work harder and want it more. Uh, that's certainly true at, at Grey London. You know, we, we've, in the time that we've been going, beaten some people that are definitely better at their jobs than us because we just wanted it more. So I think that's an important thing. Creativity hates ego. We talked about that. This is the other thing. I think if you're not embracing creativity, i.e. change, and the sort of creativity I'm talking about, I'm not just talking about waking up in the morning and saying, yeah, we're creative. I'm talking about changing your business around some of these issues. You're making it your enemy if you don't. And that's even worse, right? So look to your culture, set fires, kill process, and stamp on preciousness. If there's one thing I'd love you to take out of this, it's preciousness should die. This sort of tweaking and this sort of ownership and this worry about all that. We have to kill that in our game because it's getting in the way. Lastly, creativity doesn't give a shit about the past. And I just want to say that because anybody's not sat currently at a good agency, and this was true of us, I remember people saying, oh, we're, you're not Wyden, you know, we're not mother. Um, I just think all that's bollocks. You know, creativity or an agency is just about the people that you, that you work with. Uh, and you can change anything. This is uh, what someone said about Gray. Gray was at the dog end of the agency scale. They blamed the name, they blamed the offices, they blamed the clients. Across the decades, a succession of creative chiefs came in with a mission to transform nothing. It remained, as they privately admitted, a bit shit. Uh, well, 
you know, the last five years and the, the people I've been lucky enough to work with, we've sort of turned that round. Uh, that last bit of the quote was not anymore. After all those countless failures, Gray's at the top. Um, how we do it is just a constant belief that something might go wrong. <laughs> Uh, a constant air of panic. This is a quote from Death of a Salesman. It's on the wall in our company. It's the only quote we have in the agency. I'm not interested in stories about the past or any crap of that kind, because the woods are burning. There's a big blaze going all around. The woods are burning. All around you, someone is better. The world is changing. You have to adapt. You have to keep your eye on it, and you have to be passionate about it. Um, so that's it, really. Thanks. <laughs>